Hi, I'm Randy Reed, Executive Director of the National Lighting Bureau, and I am joined today by Dr. Robert White, Director, Regional Newborn Program at Beacons Children Hospital in South Bend, Indiana. This is the second in our series, Let's Talk About Light and Health, and today's discussion is entitled, Out of the Womb, Lighting Up the NICU. Dr. White, welcome. Thank you, Randy. Well, give us a little on your background and how you came to be the director of the Regional Newborn Program back in 1981. Well, I grew up in this area, went to school at Notre Dame, then went out to Johns Hopkins for all of my medical training. When I was done with that and ready to get a job as a neonatologist, it was early on in the course of neonatology, so a lot of places were just getting started. One of those was the hospital here in South Bend, so very close to my hometown, and they were looking for a neonatologist to start their program. So it was a great opportunity. I made one request of them. I was really interested in the environment of care in the NICU. I, I thought it was pretty awful in uh, the NICUs I had trained in and been in, and so one of the things I asked for as a term of of coming was that they'd be willing to build a world-class NICU. Um, and they agreed. Um, so I was happy to come. And within five years, we had built a NICU that was much different than the ones uh, typical for that time. And we did have people come from all over the world to take a look at it. So that built an interest in, in that um, topic of neonatology for me for the rest of my career. Okay, so when was it completed? When was the construction completed? That was 1986. Okay. And it lasted us until uh, 2017. We are now in a new unit, so what you see behind me is the second world-class unit that we've built, but okay. uh, we were in that one for 31 years. That's where I was going. So tell us a little bit about how NICUs have changed uh, from the work that you've done. Well, when I first started as in neonatology, NICUs were big open wards that had many babies, 10 or 15 babies in each room. They were brightly lit, usually didn't have windows. They were very noisy, very crowded. Family participation was very restricted. When I first started, families could come in for 15 minutes a day and they could touch their baby maybe and that was it. They couldn't hold them or, or have any other interaction with them. So it was, if you can imagine what the worst possible environment would be for the care of a newborn baby who's going through this really important stage of development, it is the worst possible environment that we could have put them in. From that, we have come a long way, and we'll talk a little bit more, I, I think, about how we got here, but now we're much more interested in making sure families have as much time with their babies as possible. And the design of our NICUs has been driven a lot by that consideration. Well, speaking of which, I have a five-year-old grand twins and they were born a month early, three and a half pounds each, and they lived their first month in the NICU. And even as a grandparent, I got to go in and see them. So I do think they have come a long way, but I will tell you, uh, there was a lot of light. There was a lot of light that I noticed. And just for me, the wires, the tubes, the noise, it just broke my heart. And I just said, these kids will never be normal. And they're happy, healthy five-year-old girls and all worked well. So we have a, a huge uh, amount of respect for the NICU and for the people and for the work that you guys do. Thank you. Uh, we learned a little bit last month in our series about circadian rhythms. Can you tell us specifically about circadian rhythms for babies? Yeah, it's really fascinating because babies develop a circadian rhythm in utero. They get the signaling for that from their mother. So both through substances that cross the placenta and as well as the mother's own activity. It's fascinating in part because the baby's cycle is offset from the mother's a little bit. And many pregnant women will tell you this in the third trimester that just when they're ready to 
shut down for the day and, and rest, the baby becomes very active. I think the reason for this is, this is just my hypothesis, that the mother's metabolic capability is trying to manage things for two organisms at that point, one of which is growing rapidly. So although the baby is small, they still have major metabolic requirements. So if the mother is active during the day, but the baby becomes more active when the mother is quiet, that doesn't put quite as much demand on the mother's circulation and oxygen delivery and, and metabolic requirements that would otherwise uh, have the mother and baby in conflict. But in any case, that rhythm is well established by the time the baby is born. And even by the beginning of the third trimester where some of the kids end up coming into our NICUs. Okay. Well, tell me a little bit about the importance of time-stamped breast milk. Well, after a baby is born, then they have to get their circadian cues somewhere else. Typically, that's going to be from the environment and light, daylight is a component of that. But it was discovered probably 30 years ago now, that another cue that a baby has for circadian rhythm is through the mother's breast milk. This was discovered in maternal milk in babies born at term, and it showed a very clear distinction in the presence of certain hormones as well as um, minerals, calcium and phosphorus, for example, in the breast milk. We repeated that study in premature newborns which um, Mariana, your guest last month, was uh, one of the people who really helped us do that research and showed that that same phenomenon is true even when moms deliver prematurely. So if that's intended to be a circadian signal for babies, it's just as important in premature babies as in full terms, we hypothesized. And so we give milk to babies according to the time of day in which the mom pumped it. So our moms pump their milk, um, put little stickers on to indicate whether it was pumped during the day or the night. And we then give it to babies at that same time of day or night within a 12 hour range um, so that we can give them those circadian signals. The circadian system is really fascinating because it's not just the pineal gland that is taking care of melatonin for us. It's been shown in babies and even more so in older folks that many other organs have an independent circadian rhythm that is probably meant to be tuned with the brain and the primary circadian rhythm, but all these other organs have this independent cycling as well. So there's much more we need to learn about circadian rhythms, but it's not really just a simple, your melatonin goes up and down. Sure, that's fascinating. And I will tell you, I don't think what you have just described is very well known. No, it's um, not. My, my daughter had a, had a baby a year and a half ago and she pumped quite a bit. And to my knowledge, she had never heard of this. Uh, I've never heard of it before studying preparing for this session. Yeah, I think we we are one of the few units in the world that do this um, because it does take a little more effort. And our publication is the only one in the literature so far. So as much as um, people are inundated with research studies, it was probably pretty easy to miss. But I feel confident that as we understand more and more, it will become something that uh, is typical for people to do because it's not that hard. It, it is a little bit of an effort, but we right. can do that. Right, sure. Just give people the information and let them make their decision. So let's get to the lighting of the NICU because how difficult is it to light a, a room that's got to have 24 seven uh, applications for the staff, yet you're trying to get babies to tune their circadian rhythm. How does that work? Yeah, so we have multiple considerations the babies themselves are maturing. So we have some kids who are 24 weeks gestation, other kids who are full term. Right. Their needs may be different. Certainly their 
the stresses that bright lighting could put on them will be different at those stages. Then we also have staff who are in those rooms and have their own circadian needs. And that's different for the day shift nurses who might need some bright lighting to help them stay alert and, and to continue to trigger their circadian cycle properly compared to night nurses who we don't wanna give those bright lights to and suppress their circadian cycle so they can't sleep the next day when they get home and, and they get all out of sync. And then we have the families who are in there who have their own needs as well. So trying to get the lighting right for all of those populations is a challenge. And obviously one big component of that is to make it flexible. But to start with the baby's space, we don't want any bright light directly in the baby's eyes. So it's all indirect lighting. And that is accomplished um, using multiple luminaires that give us some flexibility to turn on and off as we need. We have a procedure light, for example. So if we're starting an IV or putting in a catheter, we can use that procedure light just on the limb that we're working with without getting it in the baby's eyes. We have this ambient lighting at the bedside, and then we have lighting in other parts of the room. Some of it just for fun. For example, we have uh, LED lighting that parents can change the color of so that when it's Notre Dame football game day, um, they can make the lighting over the sink is where this LED is. Uh, they can make that green. Um, and, and who has control over that, by the way? Who can control the color temperature or the color? Either the family or the nurses can do it. Okay, okay. So for Valentine's Day, we had a lot of red. Um, sure. And um, that's sort of whimsical more than anything, but it, it does give you that sense that we want there to be some individual control and, and make this as much like home as we can, not too clinical. There's even UV lighting. I know we're going to talk about that in a little bit. Um, over the sinks, UVA lighting that will help keep our surfaces as clean as possible. Okay, so there so are multiple let's, challenges. Let's do, if I may, you're one of the first to participate in research using UV and UVA to disinfect in the NICU spaces. How is that working? Well, we did the trial with Mark Ray and Mariana um, and our colleagues at GE and showed that even though we are the cleanest place in the hospital, our hospital does surveillance and um, monitors surface contamination in many units throughout the hospital and we always come out best. So we do a really good job of that, but we still have contamination. Right. And nosocomial infection is a really serious problem for preterm babies. So we wanted, um, additional ways of keeping our environment as clean as possible. And when Mark approached us about this trial uh, using UVA, we were very happy to participate in that. So we showed um, using controlled situations, we, we installed the lights in multiple rooms and then had days when they were on and periods of time when they were off and did many cultures and um, other infection control measurements to demonstrate that during the days that the UV, UVA light was in use, the bacterial contamination of these surfaces was significantly lower. So okay. since completing that study, we have purchased uh, several lights and several of our rooms plus our breast milk preparation area, which is an area we want to keep really clean, and our IV preparation area also have these UVA lights installed. The beauty of UVA is that it is in continuous use. So when our cleaning folks come around and, and clean the counters and the sink two or three times a day, they're clean at that moment. But the moment someone comes to wash their hands, that sink is contaminated. Or if something is laid down on a counter, <clears throat> it becomes contaminated immediately after and doesn't get cleaned with chemicals again until eight or 12 hours later. The UVA, however, is always there. 
So it keeps the bacterial colonization down continuously in a way that we could never accomplish with either, either chemical cleaners or with UVC. This is the original layout of our NICU. You're looking at it from the outside, obviously. And um, we wanted to be a little whimsical, use a lot of color, make sure that people from the moment they approached us knew that this was going to be a little different than the typical hospital setting they were used to. This is the floor plan of our NICU. You'll see the central area is an atrium, and I think you'll see pictures of that later. This was a really unique aspect of this NICU. I, I think we are the only one in the world that has this feature. Our previous NICU had skylights, so it raised the ceiling. It brought daylight into the NICU all day long. Um, it, it was really unique in that respect as well. So this atrium is just expanding on this concept. And I can tell you that just for me, having been here day in and day out, walking out from our workspace into that atrium on a sunny day, just brightens my spirits, um, makes everything about the day a little bit better. I think that's true for families as well who uh, walk out of their baby's room in a situation that might be very difficult to see some sunlight, to see a little bit of the outside world is a piece of what we hope we can offer families instead of completely enclosing them in this hyper intense environment. This is our entry area. Um, and you can see through the front door into that atrium. So that's what greets people as they walk in. Not a bunch of lights and alarms, uh, not a bunch of signs. We want a place for the kids to be distracted so they're not at the bedside uh, distracting their parents from the care of their baby. So it is intended to be a place for the entire family. This balcony area is much nicer now. Uh, this is when we first moved in. Um, the nurses have really done a wonderful job of embracing this concept and um, have done a lot of planting. So it's snow covered this moment, but in the spring, there'll be all sorts of flowering bulbs and lilac trees and dogwoods um, mm. blooming on our balcony. So again, for families who maybe don't want to leave the hospital um, to, to go outside, they can just come here for a few minutes, a few steps away from their baby's room and have lunch and, and decompress. It's another look into the atrium. And that's uh, from a slightly different view, but this atrium of course uh, goes all around the center of the NICU. So there's plenty of spaces for folks to meet and um, have casual conversations you notice the floor is carpeted. That's unusual in a hospital setting, but it keeps the noise down dramatically. And it does set a very different tone again for the kind of place this is. It's not meant to look very sterile and clinical, but rather look a little bit closer to home for most people. Here's the patient room and you will see the infant space to the right that does have a lot of monitors. I can tell you though that those do not have audio alarms for the most part. There's a couple that we weren't able to get on to our electronic system that still do alarm like the ventilator just above the mom's, just to the left of the mom's head. Um, we don't have a way of integrating those alarms into our system, but all the other alarms come through the nurse's cell phones as a uh, vibration that alerts them to the fact that the baby might be in alarm condition, but none of those alarms sound at the bedside. You'll see some space for families uh, towards the back. There's a, a desk um, and then these sliding glass doors that go into the parent space, which has a sofa bed, it has a bathroom, has a refrigerator, has outlets so they can plug in and work if they need to. Um, so it really is a space where families can make it their home away from home. And 
at Christmas, um, they're often decorated. You see uh, on that green wall on the left-hand side, some mementos that are on a string that this mom has placed for her baby. Uh, but the families can um, really personalize the space, especially if they're going to be there for many weeks. On less cluttered view of the patient space, so you get a better idea of the lighting. Uh, from behind those sliding glass doors, that's daylight coming in through the window. Um, you see the procedure light directly over the incubator, but there no, are no other direct lights that the baby would be exposed to. And when we use that, we can focus it away from the baby's eyes as well. And then the head walls on either side, you see some um, lighting that goes up onto the uh, wall above and below it. There's some can lighting in the ceiling that's away from the bedside that provides lighting over other spaces where people would be wanting more direct lighting. Um, we do have uh, vinyl flooring in the rooms, not carpet, uh, but these rooms are still very quiet. We worked, the, the major source of noise that we really had to address was the heating and ventilation system. And our engineers did a great job with that so that these rooms are much, much quieter than um, the typical in ICU and even quieter than lots of people's living rooms at home. This is uh, what we call our couple of care rooms. So in this case, the mother is still a patient. This is right after she has delivered. She can be a patient right there in the room with the baby. That is a very unusual feature. It is one that I think will become the standard in the future so that we're not separating mothers and babies at a time that the baby is critically ill and the mother is scared to death. Uh, she can be right there. A few moms choose not to and, and that's okay, but most moms want to be there. And it's very helpful for us too that instead of seeing a baby and then going across the hospital to the maternity ward to give a report to the mother. She's right there. She knows what's going on. We can have a conversation and tell her what our game plan is. So this setting is one that um, we were the first intensive care nursery in the country to provide, but there are a number of other units that have now opened or are in the process of being designed that will incorporate this concept. This is just outside the patient rooms. Um, one of the things we learned from families as we included them in our planning for this NICU was that they wanted bright colors. Our nurses, when they went through the first pass of the design with the architects, chose pastels and muted colors, but the family said, no, we, we'd rather a place that was bright. And so that not only tells you what's important about the colors, but what's important about the lighting. Um, we don't need to keep the lighting dim and, and low key, some might say. Um, lighting that's fairly bright is good for people, for their alertness, for their circadian rhythms, and for their general overall psychological well-being. At night, at three in the morning, is it the same light level? No, so um, in the patient room, the, the light is much lower. In the nurse's station, the light is much lower. And in the hallways, these overhead lights, the ones that are just above the doors of the patient rooms and the one that's over the nurse's work area, those lights are all off at night. Here's another photo that demonstrates our attempt at the end of a hallway. We still have a conference room but if you're walking down this hallway, you can still see through this actually where I'm sitting right now. So the, the window behind me is the same window at the front of this photo. Um, so that hallway isn't blocked off, even though there's a conference room there, you can still get daylight. One more photo again, demonstrating um, hallway. In this case, it's into the atrium. So the trees and leaves that you see there are the graphics on the atrium wall. And then the window at the far end is actually a patient room. 
with mirror glass. So the families can look out those windows into the atrium, but we can't see into their room. Uh, so they get daylight and privacy at the same time. So Dr. White, can you tell our audience a little bit about the changes that you have seen in the NICU, not just locally, but I guess nationally, and how you have achieved these? Yeah, so after we built this new unit uh, back in 1986 and had a lot of people coming to look at it, one of the things that was clear was that the codes that were written for hospital construction at the time were actually getting in the way of better design of NICUs. So our idea was that we would put together a consensus committee that would help design, write new codes for NICU design. So we convened this committee back in the early 90s. It incorporated nurses, therapists, doctors, architects, and experts from industry, including Mark Ray for lighting, for example, into a consensus committee that looked at all the requirements for NICU design and decided what the minimum standard should be based on evidence that was available. So we had this strong criteria. It had to be evidence-based if we were going to change what the recommendations were. And it had to be a consensus. And we defined consensus as everybody in the group minus one. So we didn't want something that was just a majority vote. If there was a fair amount of uncertainty, if this was really the right way to go, we wanted everyone to be convinced that the evidence pointed in favor of this change, but we didn't want to leave it in a situation where one person who wasn't quite sure and really didn't think that was the right thing could stymie the whole progress that the committee thought we should move forward with. So that consensus minus one was the way we worked the committee and it's worked extremely well. We have had, um, nine iterations now of this. The Facilities Guideline Institute, which writes the standards for hospital construction and is the default uh, for most state code organizations, has adopted these into their guidelines as well. So, for example, when we first started, you weren't allowed to put windows in newborn ICUs. The thought was that if you put a baby next to a window, there would be excessive heat loss to the outside and that would be dangerous to the baby. Well, we realized and showed in our unit, for example, with the skylights, that there were ways to do this without having the baby next to the window. You could still have a window and not put the baby next to it. So, um, that's so the an example. Facilities Guideline Institute, they've adopted that now. Is that correct? Yes. That's right. Okay. So, um, and, and in fact, we're moving towards a point where we're requiring windows because we want families in the room with the baby and they need the windows. So even though the baby may not need the window, the family and the staff benefit from it. And we did this on, on many other levels, um, how the head wall was designed, how much space there was, what the support for families would be within these rooms. And that whole process has um, gone over the last 30 years to help facilitate a really dramatic change, more dramatic in the NICU than anywhere else in the hospital from where we used to be to where we are now. We used to be kind of the most unpleasant place to be to uh, now I, I think this is the most uplifting, um, right place to be. And we need that because in an adult ICU or a pediatric ICU, a kid might be there for a couple, three days, and then they're better and, and go out to the ward or, or go home. In the newborn ICU, babies are here for weeks or months right. through a very crucial stage of their development. And the families are going through a very crucial stage as well. This may be their first baby. This may be a new relation for them. And this is all happening under very stressful con conditions. So it's more important maybe than any other place in the hospital to get it right and make sure that people have the proper medical support and the recommended standards do go into all of that for sure. 
but we want them to have the other supports the hospital should be providing that may not be which medication or which IV the baby's getting, but are still very important to their success, survival, long-term development. Well, from everything I've seen and everything you've said, it sure tells me that you're doing it right. And I am glad to see that the research and what you've learned isn't staying in South Bend, that it is being adopted by the facilities guidelines and going nationwide, and I assume even worldwide, correct? Yes, and the amount of research that's coming out to help drive these changes is really dramatic. And again, I think more in the NICU than any other place in the hospital, we have lots of research on how the environment affects our patients. And that's continuing. And Mark and Mariana have been a big part of that. I, I mentioned a couple of studies that we participated in with them. Mariana helped us with a, a study on breast milk. Mark helped us with a study on UV lighting. And we've done several other studies in conjunction with that team. That kind of research is happening more in the NICU than any other place in the hospital. And so we can make these changes based on evidence, not just based on somebody's opinion. Well, Dr. White, thank you for this. And we will now open the floor for questions. Okay. Thank you all for attending today, and we will now open the floor to questions. Please use the Q&A button to ask your question, and then if you'll hit the raise hand button, that will help us to see the question, and we will unmute your mic. We want to thank our sponsor, GE Current, a Dane Tree Company, for making today's session possible. We could not produce these segments if it weren't for the generosity of our sponsors, so thank you, GE Current. And I'd also like to thank Dr. White for sharing his expertise with us and with our audience today. Next, I want to introduce Allison Thayer. Allison is the producer of our series, Let's Talk About Light and Health, and she will monitor the Q&A. Allison? Great. Thank you so much, Randy. Thank you for everybody for attending um, and Dr. White for that great interview. Um, before we get started with the questions, I just wanted to remind you that uh, we'll have another talk next month as well, an interview with uh, Dr. Sophia Axelrod on um, <coughs> Similar topic, a new kind of lullaby um, about the robust actual light dark pattern for babies. So stay tuned for that one as well. Um, so we are getting a couple questions in now. So I appreciate the um, participation and we really want to hear from everyone. Uh, we have a, a great range of people and attendees here today um, from different backgrounds and lighting um, to different uh, nurses within the NICU. And um, we also wanna hear if you're a parent in different experiences experiences that you've had, um, whether you're, you are a parent in the NICU, uh, the NICU, or, um, you know, other family members that you've seen. So please have the questions come in. So first question we have from Jay. Um, the question, uh, would you like to ask your question, Jay? Uh, thank you for a great presentation and for amazing work that you're doing, all of you, uh, both at the NICU and the lighting folks. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what difference uh, these measures uh, or changes in the environment and particularly focusing on lighting, what difference have they made uh, in, the, in, in the outcomes and in, in, in what, whatever you consider those to be, obviously one, the one important set would be on, on the uh, development and thriving uh, of, of the uh, infants, but any, anything that you've, you've looked at would be of interest. So thank you very much. Sure, thanks, Jay. Um, the first study that was done on this question, to the best of my knowledge, was in the 1980s in England. Back then, everyone had really bright, brightly lit NICUs 24 hours a day. And they decided to try, just in their step-down areas, these are the kids that are no longer critically ill, but are still too small to go home. Um, so they're, they're pretty stable babies. And they decided to divide those up into two groups, one where the lights stayed on 24 seven and the other where they turned them off at night. And they asked mothers to keep a journal once the kids went home. And to uh, maybe oversimplify the results, 
the journals showed that the mothers liked the babies who had been cared for in the room that was dark at night a lot better at six months of age than those mothers who were caring for babies that had stayed in the room that was continuously lit. I'm going to guess that that was because those babies slept better and, and were easier to get to bed at night, that their circadian rhythm was better established. What we know for sure, objectively, was that those babies weighed about a pound more than their counterparts who were in the control group. So that was the first study. Several subsequent studies were done, some comparing continuous bright light to circadian lighting. The other, there, once we realized that continuous bright lighting was a bad idea, we went the other direction and, and the theory was, well, in utero, babies have continuous dim lighting, so that's how we'll keep the NICU. And those randomized trials were done as well and still showed the babies that were in a circadian lighted environment did better than either continuous bright or continuous dim lighting. And they looked at various outcome measures. Weight gain was one of them. Length of stay in the hospital was another. But the, the important thing to note about the continuous dim lighting is that while that is what the babies get in utero, in utero, they still have those other circadian stimuli from the mother that I mentioned. Whereas once they're delivered, they lose the circadian stimuli from the mother, and then we're not giving them any from the environment as well. So those are the studies that have been done, and the outcomes, weight gain, and, and um, length of stay have been the primary ones more recently. Um, question was, when the babies are born prematurely, is it best to start the environmental entrainment learning from the time they are born, or is it preferred to wait until the time they are normally born? Yeah, all the research has been done from the time of birth or within a few days after. Those kids, if they had stayed in utero, uh, would be getting circadian signals from the mother throughout that third trimester of pregnancy. So biologically, it does not make sense to me that we would wait and, and not give them our alternative signals that the mother can no longer transmit to them, um, that we would wait to give them our signals and until their full term. And that's the way the studies have been done. So that environmental entrainment learning, as you put it, um, is best done from the time they enter the newborn ICU. The first two or three days for kids who are really critically ill, we may keep the room pretty dark for those kids. And there are still places who aren't quite convinced about this, so they keep the room dark a lot longer. But I think the evidence is good that it can be started shortly after birth. Uh, next question we have. Have the new design choices shortened the length of stay? And similarly, has there been a noticeable positive impact on the staff? Those studies on babies did, some studies did show a shortened length of stay. There have been fewer studies on the positive impact on staff in the newborn ICU, but elsewhere in the hospital, those studies have been done and have showed that there is a positive impact on staff. Mark and Mariana are in a better position to comment on that because they've done so much of that research, but the answer is yes for both of those. The next one that I have is, what is the biggest challenge you face while trying to define lighting configurations and specifications for the NICU units? Um, inertia. People don't like to change. People make up reasons why they're continuing to do the things they did, even though there was no good reason to do it in the first place. Um, they've decided that, well, this is how we've always done it. So you have to give us really good evidence before we're going to change. Actually, there were some reasons. For example, we had Nick use bright all the time very early on because that's the only way we could tell if a kid was pink or blue. Now we have saturation monitors, so we don't need that anymore. And then as I said, a number of places think we should keep it dark because that's the way it is in utero, even though there are other biological differences more important than that. Um, but I think this inertia about you've got to prevent, present us a whole lot more data to change than we have to support our current practice. Um, so that's human nature. And can you think of ways um, 
to make people less um, averse to these changes? Um, is it, you, know, you said it's the, the research, but the, the education of it as well and getting people more on board to ask for these changes? Yeah, and I, um, I think just as the Mark and Mariana's team are really not only strongly committed to research, but strongly committed to education and getting the word out. We do a lot of good research that a lot of people don't know about because they don't read all those journals. So finding other ways to get the message out is really important. And just like this series, um, I think that's how we can have a lot more impact than just publishing an article. Mark, would you like to ask your question? Well, I just want to compliment you, Allison, on you know making you you had this idea, and I do think it's a very powerful way to get to know people like Dr. White. But Bob, um, the question I have, um, and I should know the answer, the eye development. I mean, this is the route to the biological clock. And so when the question was asked, should you wait till full term? I, and we agree that that's not the right answer, but there must be a point at which it doesn't matter what the environment is because the eyes haven't developed well enough yet to send signals to the, to the biological clock. Can, can you give us a sense of when that happens to the best of your knowledge? Because I'm not sure I know. And um, it, there must be a gap or maybe there isn't a gap, but maybe you could comment on that. Yeah, this research was done by uh, the primary author is Scott Rifkes. Um, and Scott worked with uh, premature baboons and showed that the retinal hypothalamic tract was intact by early in the third trimester equivalent for those baboons. So that's what you have to have. The eyes have to be able to receive the light signal and then transmit it to the pineal gland. And that happens through the retinal hypothalamic tract. So that's how we know that almost all of the kids that we get, we have a few kids before the third trimester, but nearly all of them are third trimester at the beginning or, or into the middle of third trimester and their retinal hypothalamic tracts are intact. You also asked about, is it the same for the visual system? The retina is not very well developed at the beginning of the third trimester. And the visual cortex in the brain is not very well developed either. The auditory cortex, for example, develops much earlier than the visual cortex. So um, this sensitivity to light and dark is developed sooner than the visual capability that we associate with um, seeing faces and, and making out images, that's a later developing skill for babies. So the next question we have from Shay, the question is, what is the science behind light being used to enhance and treat the uh, measures? And can you also uh, mention what is that for our, our audience members who may not know all of these different terms? Billy Rubin uh, was the Billy term. Rubin, yeah. <laughs> Read it too so fast. The discovery that light could cause photoisomerization of the bilirubin molecule was made many years ago, uh, at least 50 years ago, by a nun in a Catholic hospital who noticed that the babies who were next to a window had less jaundice than the babies who were more inboard in the room. Um, and from that observation, a lot of research was done that showed that the normal isomer isomeric form of the biliary molecule has to be conjugated in the liver, has to have another chemical added to it in the liver before it can be removed from the body. But exposure to light causes this other isomeric form, which can then be excreted without going through that process in the liver. So if a baby's liver is immature or diseased, Phototherapy can help the baby get rid of bilirubin that they could not otherwise do. So um, that's a standard practice in treating jaundice in newborns. And it turns out there's a very specific area in the spectrum, in the blue-green part of the spectrum, that is most effective in doing this. 
And that is for um, light on the skin, is that correct? Yes. Versus light through the eye? Correct. We actually uh, put blindfold on the baby when we do that so that we're not exposing them to a bright light to the eye. <clears throat> Along those lines, uh, Kieran has a question of how much light do babies receive in the womb? That's fascinating too. It's more than you might imagine. Um, we don't have a really good way of measuring that and it probably is insignificant in terms of these things that we're talking about because for example, we don't know if the baby's eyes our eyelids are open or closed, but we presume they're closed a good part of the time. So even measuring what's present with a probe in the amniotic fluid doesn't tell you how much is actually getting through to the baby's retina. Um, it's probably not enough to be clinically significant. Similarly, we have another question uh, with light to the eyes. So are there any concerns about exposing light to the eyes of the infants that would either advance or delay the development of the eyes of infants? Um, is the lack of light unwanted at some point during the development and is presence of light unwanted at some point in the infant's eye? There was concern about that when we started turning the lights um, off, we thought maybe we could by doing so, we would protect babies from one of the problems that premature babies get, which is retinopathy of prematurity. That's caused by <clears throat> excessive oxygen exposure. And so the retina gets more oxygen than it is supposed to get in utero. That causes constriction of the arteries in the retina. And then the retina doesn't develop as well as it should, develop scar tissue and that can actually cause blindness. So Stevie Wonder, for example, the singer, um, was born prematurely and, and was blind because of being exposed to excessive oxygen long before we, we knew that it could do that. So we knew about oxygen and, and then people wondered maybe light can do this too. Maybe excessive light can cause damage to the retina. And some of these kids who are getting blind from retinopathy of premature, it's not just the oxygen, but it's the bright lights in the NICU. As it turned out, turning the lights down and protecting babies from bright lights, in any case, even if you have some lighting in the room like we do, none of it's a direct light to the baby's eyes. Um, that did not change in the um, randomized controlled trials as did not change the, the instance of retinopathy prematurity. So within the limits of nobody's tried shining bright lights in the kid's eyes all the time, and, and maybe that would be damaging, but at the levels that we're talking about to give a circadian stimulus, it does not cause any damage or, or advance the development of the retina. That's very interesting. Um, and with the next question kind of fitting in, um, could the babies then receive, um, be sensing light through their skin? Well, that is a fascinating question. Not only babies, but maybe all of us. There is some evidence, and I haven't reviewed this literature recently, so probably even more now. But yes, um, the light exposure of our skin, and, and there's even suggestions that it's certain parts of the anatomy where that's most notable, um, that can affect the peripheral circadian rhythms that are present in our body. Very fascinating. Um, so I don't have any more questions right now, but um, I do have a, a question for you, Dr. White. Um, what do you see about the future of lighting in the NICU? You know, Randy asked me that question during the interview, and I didn't have a good answer for him. And as I've thought about it since, I think where we are is we just need more research. I think there is a lot more. This last question, for example, about light on the skin, maybe if we understood that better, we would change what our recommendations are. So we'll learn more about light exposure to other parts of the body. We'll learn more about which parts of the spectrum of lighting are most important. For particular, I, I mentioned there was one part of the spectrum that was most important for phototherapy for jaundice. 
And we know there are certain parts of the spectrum that are most important for the nurses, for the alerting um, response that, that they get, that we want them to have while, while they're at work. Um, so we'll learn more about that. We'll learn more about um, ultraviolet light and how it can be used in the hospital to keep our um, surfaces clean with UVA and to keep our air clean with UVC. There are a lot of um, exciting areas for further exploration and, and hopefully we can keep up our practice we keep our practice current with all of that new research, but at the moment, I, I'm not sure which direction that will go. Okay. Well, Dr. White, I want to personally thank you. Allison, our producer, I would like to thank you, and we'd like to thank the audience. We had a very good turnout today, and about 90% uh, stuck through to all of, the, uh, all of the questions. So, Dr. White, that's a great reflection on you. Allison, you wrap up, please, and tell everyone one more time about our next event. Yeah, sounds great. Yeah, again, thank you for, for the great questions. Um, we will be uh, posting this the recording of this video on our LinkedIn accounts. Um, so if you follow us, uh, either the National Lighting Bureau or the Light and Health Research Center, uh, we'll have it posted there. And feel free to keep the conversation going if you think of any more questions. Um, put, a, put a comment in there. Um, we'll keep the conversation going about uh, lighting in the NICU. Um, but up next, like I mentioned, for everybody uh, who's still here, that Dr. Sophia Axelrod from the Young Laboratory of Genetics um, at the Rockefeller University will be up next um, in, in March. And she'll be talking about, um, more specifically, lighting uh, for babies and a the light-dark pattern that we should be giving them um, for better sleep and for better health. Um, so we really, really appreciate everybody coming today, and we hope you, jo you join us next time. <laughs>